Oh, hey there. How's it going, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Across the Board. This is an episode on containers from the couch. Today, we have an exciting episode with three guest stars, and we, we're going to be talking about Cassandra running on EKS, and they have a pretty cool story about how they were able to scale it to over 1,200 nodes. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce the guests onto the set here. Let's scale it to over 12. All right, here we go. So we've got, uh, let's start from the top right here. Mikhail, can you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Mikhail Shapiro. I'm, uh, All right, here we go. So we've got, uh, let's start from the top right here. Mikhail, a little bit of background noise, unfortunately. Uh, sure. I'm Mikhail Shapiro. I'm, uh, hey, folks, we're getting a little bit of an echo, but uh, I think that might have caught it. Brags, maybe check if you've got the stream open on another tab here. But sorry, Mikhail, back to you. No worries. Uh, Mikhail Shapiro, I'm a partner solutions architect, container specialist uh, at AWS uh, in that role. In uh, over two years, I uh, worked with uh, a lot of great partners, um, such as DataStax uh, product providers, as well as some of the consulting partners, for example. Uh, it's a very rewarding activity. Uh, so i uh, happy to be here. With you, so. Awesome. Thank you, Mikhail. Uh, next, let's jump to Rags. Hi, uh, my name is Raghavan Srinivas, but for whatever reason, people have a tough time pronouncing my name, so I just go by Rags. I work for Datastax. Uh, is there an echo, or is Hi. it? Hi, uh, my name is Raghavan. Uh, Rags, there's still a little bit of an echo. You might have the, the stream open on a different tab. Maybe. Let me figure that out, but but basically, I uh, I come from the application development side of the world, um, and, and essentially, my mission in life is to simplify the inner loop of a developer. Awesome. Thank you, Rags. And uh, Rags and I go way back, actually. We used to work together back when we both worked at IBM. All right, Matt, over to you. I love it. It feels like a call in show hey, from the uh, 90s. Back, actually. We used to work together. Oh, hey, Rags, why don't you mute for a minute while you work on it? Perfect. Yeah. Hey, guys, I'm Matt Overstreet. Uh, I'm an architect at DataStax, working primarily with our partner teams like AWS, uh, but also a big fan of the work our, our uh, Kate Sandra team has been doing on modernizing these uh, like early versions of distributed architectures like Cassandra. Yeah, and, and I think maybe this is a good place for us to start uh, is just trying to understand what exactly is Cassandra. Uh, and I think today we've got a lot of interesting topics. We're not only gonna be talking about Cassandra, but this word, which you know, if mm -hmm. you're concerned about how to pronounce it, it's k 8 Sandra. Of course, k 8 being Kubernetes, Cassandra. Uh, so running Cassandra on Kubernetes. We're also going to be talking about how we can really run this to scale, leveraging a managed Kubernetes capability, uh, elastic Kubernetes service on AWS. But again, to bring it back all the way down to the roots, I think we need to understand what exactly is Cassandra itself. And I think that's probably the first thing that I want to start sketching out here. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me grab my markers, and we'll get started with that. Um, now. As I understand it, and this is an open-ended question here to maybe one of our folks over at DataStax, Matt or Rags. Uh, so Cassandra is an open source distributed database. It's no SQL. Um, tell us a little bit more about Cassandra uh, as I start to kind of sketch out what it looks yeah, like. Absolutely. So Cassandra comes from a lot of the same place that the other no SQL databases come from. So. Uh, we did all this beautiful work on relational data modeling, and it's all this fabulous math and the the consequences of that third normal form and constructing things that way were phenomenal. But the problem was when our data became too big or too fast to sit on one individual node, to live on one CPU clock, a lot of the promises that we got from relational just weren't available anymore. So we had this generation of NoSQL databases that were more focused on being able to, to deal with data that was bigger or faster or more varied than traditional relational data. And Cassandra is one of those. Perfect. Um, now, now, folks, real quickly, I just want to say I might be looking down here or here. I've got my laptop here. So if you're uh, in the chat and you're asking questions, uh, I can I can kind of feature them. Please don't hesitate to ask questions while we go through this. Uh, anything pointed at me or any of mm -hmm. our guests, 
and, and we can kind of keep this interactive. Um, so now we talked about a couple of things about Cassandra there, and you know this is a pretty simple representation. Whenever I hear about Cassandra, we see this ring representation uh, and these nodes. C can we talk a little bit about what exactly I drew out here? Because I found this with a go uh, quick Google image yeah. search, to be perfectly oh, honest. Oh, <laughs> I've, I've drawn that so many times, Sai. I've drawn that ring with the nodes. So what do we do when our data is too big or we've got too much of it to absorb? Well, we distribute it, and that means we run multiple nodes. Um, Cassandra, at its simplest, is really just this idea that you're going to have some block of data. Um, and that block of data is going to be identified by a primary key. And that primary key we use to denote that partition and to figure out where that partition should live on whatever machines we have available. So if I wrote uh, a row with a partition key of A, that row would get written onto whatever node A hashed out to using a murmur three algorithm. That's We can get nerdy on that, but, but for right now, all you need to know is it's a deterministic way to figure out where in a set of machines a row should live based on that key. So A might get written to a row or written to a node. And then one of the other things Cassandra would do is Cassandra would replicate that data. Typically, we replicate it three times. Makes it a little confusing when we're talking about three nodes because really, we just have a full copy of the data on each node when we do that, which can be convenient too. Often, we're dealing with you know 15 or 30 or 45. You'll notice multiple of three usually nodes. And then when we write row A to one of those nodes, we can be confident that that row A is also replicated to two more. And that's right. a big deal because it means that we can lose a node and still read any of the rows from the cluster. Right, so I wanna start writing some of these things mm -hmm. down. So yeah. uh, the first thing that we, we said was, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know uh, it's open source, you know, it's, um, I think, the key thing here is that it's it's no SQL, right? You're talking Same about kind of key you know, value it's, pairs. It's, uh, you know, uh, still getting an source, echo. You know, um, I'm not sure what's going on there. The key thing here is that it's it's no SQL. All right, I don't know. I, I don't know about you, but I kind of hate hearing my own voice. But uh, anyway, so we've got the key value pair here. So it's A equals B. You know, it's a no SQL database, so it's it's a little bit less structured. Um, and so maybe let's let's start with that. Uh, you know, we'll say it's no SQL. Um, I think another thing that we mentioned was that it's open source. It's an Apache mm -hmm. project. Uh, and now I want to get a little bit into how the replication itself occurs. So we, we talked about nodes. Um, now specifically, we have three nodes here, and a standard Cassandra cluster has got to have at least three. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? So typically what we care about, the, the way that we make sure that when we ask a question, we'll get the right answer, is we tend to query for a quorum of the replicas. We don't care which that is, but if we're replicating three times, we want essentially half plus one. We want two nodes to respond. And if we're particularly concerned about consistency in a Cassandra cluster, that gives us the ability to uh, wait until we have quorum on our writes and insist on quorum on our reads. And then it doesn't matter if we lose one of those replicas. We know that if a write came in before a read, we're going to get that value. Exactly. That's not to say that people don't run Cassandra without quorum when they want to go really fast. Uh, but quorum is the most typical way to read and write. Got it. Got it. So essentially, this replication... Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about how that occurs. Uh, so we we talked a, a little bit about this earlier, but the fact that um, you know there is no primary node here, right? Mm -hmm. There's there's no leader. How does that work? It's yeah, it's it's even more fluid than that. And that say we have fifteen nodes, right? And some node owns the A row. You don't have to write to the node that runs the A row. You just have to write to a node. And that node will go ahead and take the work of coordinating that request and making sure that it's sent to the correct replicas. OK, got it. Um, now, is there a kind of, you know, when I started Googling this, it, it said, mm -hmm. look, Cassandra is unlimited scalability. But there's got to be a limit at some point, right? I mean, how, what, what exactly does that mean? It's really more 
that we're trading off some big coordinated transactions like like joins and when we architect without joins and without certain types of transactions we actually get this linear scalability we can keep growing the cluster and keep getting additional resources for either throughput or total storage because we never um and this might be a deeper well than we want to go into but it's a it's a good chance to throw out you know buzzwords like cap we never get into a situation where we've got to stop the world and coordinate 500 nodes you're really always only dealing with the three replicas for the data that you're writing or asking for right and i think this is this is really interesting and and, I, and i'd love to kind of dive into a little bit more so again open-ended question here but the cap theorem and, mm -hmm. and uh, what exactly is it and how does it apply to cassandra itself one thing that drives me nuts and i'll throw this out about cap too is uh the only people i hear talking about cap are database developers and cap was written as a statement about distributed systems. So that means your app layer. Uh, that means that if you're waiting for your customers to put transactions into your system, you could even assume that's part of the system. But let me define cap before I hop too far off on that. So cap was this idea that when you distribute a system, that system could be consistent. That's a desirable thing for it to do. Uh, if somebody writes a record in Honolulu and somebody reads that record in Ethiopia somewhere, ideally, if the write comes in before the read, uh, you should be safe and get that read or get that right when you read, even if it's a very small time between. So that's a perfect consistency. The other thing that you might want from a distributed system is availability, right? We have an e-commerce application and we don't want a maintenance window. This application should be up for every request. And the last part of cap theorem is this idea of uh, partition tolerance. When mm -hmm. we're dealing with a distributed system, nodes go down, they, they break, uh, networks break, or as operators, we have to update nodes. And that's a partition too inside this distributed system. So cap said, look, these three things are awesome. You probably want all of them. You need to pick two of them. And from a Cassandra perspective, when you're comparing it to other databases, you're really talking about an AP, Available Partition Tolerant Database, or as I like to call it, an availability first architecture. Hmm. Cassandra says, I will always answer your queries. The data might be, in certain situations, a little bit stale, but we're really talking about, you know, 100 milliseconds as stale. Right. Yeah. And that's the whole idea there is that there, there has to be a trade-off. You can't have perfect consistency and perfect availability, especially when you're talking about kind of these distributed data store systems. So that makes perfect sense to me. I think the last one here that I need to obviously write here is the fact that it is highly available. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what brings a lot of folks to Cassandra in the first place, right? It's not just a performant open source NoSQL store, but the fact that you can scale it up and, and have it be highly available. And so I think when you know containers and Kubernetes really started to pick up a lot more traction, people realized, hey, maybe we should run Cassandra on Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. And uh, without jumping too far ahead, we already have a question in the chat asking about what the best way to run K8 Sander on EKS is. Uh, we're going to be getting to that in just a minute, but I think it might be a good time to pivot a little bit mm -hmm. and talk about that underlying infrastructure of where this, uh, you know, Cassandra instance, K8 Sander itself is actually going to itself run. Um, and so I think that that's what I want to start sketching out really quickly here. Um, but I, I think there's something that we need to clear up first. And uh, it's the idea of nodes and clusters, which is the mm. exact same terminology that Kubernetes uses in, yeah. in Cassandra. Uh, you know, while I draw this out, uh, can we talk a little bit about that so our viewers can kind of mentally segregate the idea of nodes and, and Kubernetes and nodes and Cassandra? I'm glad you said that. I'm going to try really hard to say Cassandra node, Cassandra data center, and Cassandra cluster, because there are a bunch of places where the fact that we pick the simplest word makes the conversation the most complex. Um, a Cassandra node, and and I want to get I want to listen to Mikhail get into some of the the Kubernetes stuff here, but but a Cassandra node, uh, 
is roughly analogous to a uh, Kubernetes pod. Okay, uh, and and there's something pretty interesting about the way Cassandra pods themselves run, right? Or sorry, I should say Cassandra nodes, um, because when we talk about Kubernetes, the node is really referring to, um, you know, in EC uh, in EKS, we're talking about probably EC2 instances. Mm -hmm. We're talking about virtual machines generally. Maybe you're running Kubernetes on premises. It could be bare metal servers, whatever it might be. But we're talking about kind of individual machines. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what a Kubernetes worker node is really referring to. But a Cassandra node is a little different. But I think the way it plays together on Kubernetes makes them a lot more analogous than, than, than people really realize, right? And they didn't, they didn't used to be, right? We all picked node because that was a VM or uh, a piece of hardware, a, a node in our network. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised in the future as we double down on Kubernetes as like a standard operating platform if from the Cassandra side, we stop st talking about nodes and we start talking about Cassandra pods. And maybe that's what we should do here. Right, exactly. So, um, Mikhail, maybe I'll, I'll jump to you really quickly here. Maybe talk a little bit about what I'm drawing out here, because uh, you know we want a highly available Kubernetes cluster to run Cassandra, but there's also a lot of considerations when thinking about uh, running and storing data in Kubernetes, right? And we all hear about how Kubernetes is, uh, you know, you know, we're treating applications as cattle, not pets. Uh, containers are ephemeral. And with storage, that's really not okay. Those, those, uh, that data can't just be restored, uh, you know, without the right kind of replication and backup in place. So, Mikhail, can you talk a little bit about what we're laying out as a foundation for being able to store data uh, in Kubernetes? Well, for sure. So originally, you know, Kubernetes was for, positioned as a great place to run uh, stateless workloads uh, with statefulness. Um, there is specific consideration, uh, a concept, uh, a resource such as a stateful set uh, were introduced to handle that part. It's not necessarily that different from a regular Kubernetes deployment, but the behavior on rescheduling is quite different. And uh, the way why it is sensitive is because probably you want nodes in your stateful set. And by the way, in case of Cassandra nodes and the worker nodes, they're basically one-to-one -one mapping. So it kind of makes it easier, to be honest. Um, nodes should uh, survive failure. And when they're rescheduled, let's say a node fails, uh, it, it should be able to locate um, its own volume. Probably you don't want to lose the data, et cetera. A lot of those considerations are not as uh, you know are not as uh, painful with Cassandra because of the distributed data store, but it is very relevant to just in general any stateful workloads. So once you have a stateful workload, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it still takes time, and yeah. one of the nice things about the stateful sets is uh, you're highly available anyway, and they add additional durability because you don't have to spend all your time repairing clusters because you wanted to move some pods around. Exactly. And so each pod will retain its identity, will be able to uh, look up its own volume. But there are some certain peculiarities based on where you intend to run that stateful set. And uh, we believe EKS is, uh, is a great place for it. It has its own, <laughs> um, its own peculiarity, as I said. Uh, on one hand, you want to really abstract the actual storage uh, that uh, you access. You maybe don't want to necessarily leverage um, AWS specific APIs and you leverage CSI abstraction, mm -hmm. CSI storage driver to make sure that you can uh, you can choose whatever storage provider you want to use. In that particular case, we use PBS and it's great uh, for both for performance uh, and for availability. Um, so and, let, let uh, me let me sorry sorry Mikhail, I want to interrupt no. you real quick there because I think what what, what I'm Maybe I should explain what I've drawn out here. So I've got, um, you know, w uh, we've got kind of availability zones here. Uh, and so what we want to do, of course, is one, we want this to be highly available. So first thing is we probably shouldn't deploy everything into the same data center, right? So for our viewers out there, maybe first let's start with the outer box, and then we'll start diving in a little bit deeper. Um, can, can you talk quickly about how EKS clusters are structured? And, and maybe how availability zones enable kind of more highly available workloads? Yeah, for sure. So uh, availability zone is effectively a rough abstraction to, of a, a data center, but co-located within the same region. 
and we want to take full advantage to uh, achieve uh, high availability for our ETS clusters, we have a couple of strategies. One is that we can just allocate our nodes directly in many availability zones, let's say at least three, to achieve uh, the same parity, by the way, the number of three mm -hmm. <laughs> to deploy to, to, to Cassandra. I was just thinking of that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so that's definitely one approach. But in that case, uh, the scheduler effectively is going to be scheduling your pods across all three uh, availability zones. In addition to that, there will be some sort of a cluster outer scaler because you're not limited to just that number of nodes. You want it to grow. And it will just randomly place those nodes um, in different zones, uh, achieving some fairly uniform distribution. That may not be ideal for some of the uh, stateful set um, parameters of uh, the peculiarities that I was talking about when I started talking about the C side driver is that the PBS volumes are unfortunately uh, or fortunately uh, AZ bound. They are mm -hmm. they belong to a specific availability zone. So mm -hmm. many choose while we use this in you know, a region based um, approach, which is effectively a single cluster or a scalar, we use multiple availability zones, we're going to be spreading our nodes across all three availability zones. And uh, Cassandra and CAS operator uh, uh, it helps greatly, uh, you know, achieving uh, the scalability in that particular use case. Another approach could be uh, having effectively a cluster auto scalar per individual zone and pushing your stateful sets to a specific uh, uh, availability zone just because it's easier to handle uh, EBS volumes, they will be always allocated within a specific data center or a specific availability zone. Uh, so that, those are a couple of considerations. For simplicity, let's maybe focus on the approach that we used uh, in that particular uh, scalability test, uh, which was effectively a single cluster artist with a simpler architecture. And we'll talk about uh, pros and cons of using it that way. OK, so maybe let's talk about that real quick, because you guys have done some really cool work around scalability of, of Cassandra, uh, especially on EKS. And roughly, that's what we have drawn out here, right? So we've got an EKS cluster. This is one big VPC. Uh, we've got multiple availability zones, and we've got worker nodes on each of the availability zones. And you know, realistically, we can scale out the number of nodes in each of these. Uh, you mentioned we want EBS volumes. Um, so you know, uh, realistically, we're using the Kubernetes CSI container storage interface to connect the EBS volumes, Elastic Block mm -hmm. Store, to those nodes. Uh, you mentioned the, the EBS volumes are kind of tied to zones. So, uh, and of course, you only want to have one volume per uh, kind of uh, node here. Uh, so th this is kind of the, the, the structure that we have here for the underlying infrastructure of where we want to actually run Cassandra. Um, now, I know that recently we uh, improved some of the control plane scalability and then kind of some of the ability for us to scale up to nodes as well. Um, and I think that ties in pretty, pretty closely to the work that your team has done with testing the scalability of Kate Sandra on EKS. So um, I know that you know Matt and Mikhail, you were both kind of working together on this. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that 1,200 nodes that we were able to get to. Well, for sure, I can start with just the part that is related to the control plane because we kind of like put a very small box around it, but it's a very significant component of the Kubernetes cluster. And that component uh, must scale along with the cluster. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the, you know, the actual workload scaling. But if your control plane doesn't scale, it, um, it's very little relevance to how much you want to scale the rest of your cluster. Yeah. And uh, the, we, we made recent improvements, which we will uh, cover a little bit uh, later, uh, with respect to how control plane of EKS can scale and how fast it achieves that. For this particular effort, we used uh, effectively an interaction with the uh, AWS performance team to scale out our last cluster ahead of time um, and based on some parameters that we provided to the team. Uh, with the recent improvements, it may not be necessary anymore. And I'm very much looking forward to, to prove it out as well uh, on a, a bigger test uh, of ideal with Cassandra as well. Very cool. Yeah, I'm super curious to see uh, kind of some of the, the the work that's come out from that. I know it's a it's a great way to test not only kind of the underlying EKS piece, but uh, Cassandra. 
itself. Now, uh, Cassandra says that they have unlimited scalability. Now, EKS, we uh, we're not going to say unlimited, but we you know we're pretty proud about the the, the scalability advancements that we've made over the past few years. Uh, uh, maybe I'll gear this question to Matt here. Uh, <laughs> talk a little bit about you know maybe how much were we able to scale and maybe why we couldn't go even more. You set me up, Sai. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have unlimited scalability. We have near linear scalability, but there is a limit and that limit starts to show up around maybe 1200 nodes. So we were sort of racing with the EKS team to see who would break first and the EKS team won. We had about 1200 nodes and we started to see some issues with the gossip protocol inside Cassandra and the gossip protocol uh, is used to figure out what the topology of the Cassandra cluster is. Um, and the shrewd people in the audience are probably realizing that that's actually a little bit of an overlap with Kubernetes too. So there has been some discussion. I don't know what will come of this, uh, but what does it look like if Cassandra starts to rely on Kubernetes for its cluster state instead of gossiping? Do we then go above 1,200 nodes uh, to 5,000 nodes or whatever our conceptual limit is for Kubernetes? Yeah, and and you know I, that that brings up a really interesting point about you know can we utilize native Kubernetes APIs in a certain way? Um, you know, at the end of the day, Kubernetes is open source, and one of the coolest things about it is very pluggable. So uh, the, the open source community around it has just skyrocketed, uh, and and Cassandra is no stranger to that. So I think uh, this is probably a perfect segue to talk about ways that Cassandra has already kind of adjusted certain pieces of maybe deploying it uh, or managing it to better fit with the Kubernetes approach, you know, the, the control loop, controller mechanism, mm -hmm. custom resource definitions, the operator model, that kind of thing. So we've laid out the infrastructure of where Cassandra is going to run. Let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about um, the deployment aspect of it. Uh, so I'll start with kind of like I usually do in some of these videos, a user persona. And over here, is it fair to call this, let's say, a developer or sure. ops, a yeah. DevOps engineer? What's yeah. the line anymore? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first thing the DevOps engineer, what they're going to want to do is define um, you know, this, this environment itself. And so they're, they're going to want to configure the way that it's deployed. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. This code on their local machine, uh, this, this configuration. What sort of things can they configure and what is it itself? Yeah, let's talk about that in tiers. So the first thing that they're really configuring um, is EKS, right? They're deciding what the topology ought to be on EKS. They're deciding the what Mikhail was talking about with the multiple zones. Uh, they might be deciding if they're going to live in multiple regions. They might be deciding on things like instance types. By the way, M5, maybe a 2XL. Uh, maybe a 4XL if you're really going to push it. Um, but there's a lot to decide about that Kubernetes deployment. Once you've created the Kubernetes or the, the EKS deployment, then the next thing you want to do from a Cassandra side is to deploy the Kate Sandra operator. And so you alluded to talking about operators. If you haven't looked at operators from a Kubernetes side, this is such a nice development in Kubernetes. An operator uh takes some of the intelligence of a human operator and captures that inside the cluster so the kate sandra operator knows how to do a couple of things one of the things it knows how to do is if you tell if you put a resource into kubernetes that is a cassandra cluster the kate sandra operator knows how to understand that custom resource and then how to materialize that custom resource inside the cluster. So when we're going through this process, we define EKS, we Helm install Kate Sandra, and then our next step is to, to build one of the YAML files we'll send to the cluster that describes a Cassandra cluster. And that starts simply, how many nodes do we want? Okay. Three? How, Sorry, go on. Yeah. Uh, how are we going to spread those nodes across 
uh, what inside Cassandra we call racks, but let's call them availability zones. Okay. I mentioned earlier that uh, with our little three node example, we could lose a node and our replication meant that we could still answer queries. It's worth calling out here too. If you tell Kate Sandra about your AZs, Kate Sandra will stripe the replicas across the AZs. So now some node on zone A has A equals B, some node on zone B has A equals B, and some node on zone C has A equals B. What that means as an operator is you can now lose a node or you can lose an entire failure zone like an AZ and you can still resolve queries. There's a ton more we can configure there too in that uh, configuration file. Anything that if you were an operator in olden days and you uh, updated a Cassandra config, anything that you would do in a Cassandra config, you can actually pass inside uh, the YAML that you're sending to Kubernetes for that resource. So, so before before we get there, Matt, uh, yeah. does it make sense to kind of talk about the different components that Kate Sandra has, and you can you can um, kind of pick and choose those different components? Uh, you know, like for example, for back and restore, um, you know, for repairing the cluster itself, uh, mm -hmm. Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, so in different installs, I might have different requirements, and and you know, again, it's all very simple. Helm install, right, or Helm upgrade, and you're. I think. Yeah. I think that's a nice transition from the config too. So like we talked about operators and said operators sort of encapsulate some of the knowledge about running a system, mm -hmm. but that's not the only thing that you need, you know, on day one, after you've installed Cassandra, there are a lot of ways to run Cassandra Docker containers on Kubernetes, but that's not really what you need. You need Cassandra pods. You need uh reaper pods which do some anti-entropy and repair inside yeah. cassandra um you need medusa pods that give you backup and restore inside cassandra you probably want uh grafana and prometheus in there to yeah. give and, you observability and not to forget stargate as an application yes. developer you know i can use any of the apis like sql uh, graphql document mm -hmm. api um all of them are unified in the Stargate. And the nice thing about, you know, kind of uh, the config file that we were talking about, uh, you can specify the number of Stargate instances because mm -hmm. like it or not, you know, I mean, Stargate is is uh, pretty resource heavy. So, so you know, depending on on different configurations, you can adjust them as, um, as you go. Got and it. not so to put too fine a point on it, but one of the reasons that we use Kate Sandra, sorry to cut you off, Sai, is yeah. that uh, Kate Sandra isn't just Cassandra. It's Cassandra with backups, anti-entropy, observability, additional APIs, and operators, not just for the deployment, but eventually you're going to want to upgrade that cluster. And the operator can actually manage that incremental upgrade for you of taking one node down and updating it, or I'm sorry, one Cassandra pod. I'm going to change my definition here. Uh, the operator actually allows you to do that without going in and manually updating pods. So a lot of cool stuff that we covered there. So I want to first, before we talk about what's in the K8 standard yeah. pods themselves, the pods that are going to be running here. Um, so we talked about kind of the configuration that the DevOps engineer is going to actually have to configure to make this thing. Obviously, for the first thing, they're going to want some EKS configuration. Uh, so there's a number of different approaches to this. But I think the key thing here is uh, you know, we want to take advantage of infrastructure as code. GitOps principles. We want to have a solid CI/CD workflow, and uh, maybe let's let's draw that out as very simply CI/CD. And I think this is the critical thing about when we're working with technologies like um, Kubernetes is we want to make sure the thing that's running in Kubernetes is also leveraging the same kind of uh, technology. So uh, it needs to be able to support some of these GitOps tools like Flux or Argo, that kind of thing. Now I, you know, I, I don't know much about K8 Sandra. I'm learning a lot in this, but I know for EKS specifically, there's a number of ways to configure this. You know, whether you're using Terraform or CDK or Crossplane or mm -hmm. ACK, uh, and so that configuration many times is going to live um, in a way that can be deployed using CI/CD capabilities, uh, and then as well as for resources that run within uh, when you're configuring things like EBS nodes and uh, uh, that kind of thing, you can use. Kubernetes YAML. Uh, 
And I think that's, at the end of the day, the critical piece of this. It's leveraging the Kubernetes resource definition, CRDs, um, or the standard resources to, to kind of configure these. So what I'm hearing is that to configure Cassandra, uh, specifically Cade Sandra, what they've done is they've brought over all this configuration that in the past mm -hmm. was configured using different tools, and maybe maybe we should talk about what those were. But now you can configure them using <laughs> you know YAML, right? I think that's a big deal, right? That, that, that's a, a whole different way of managing this, this thing that's been around for a long time. Too often those tools were SSH and VI to go into <laughs> each of the nodes and make the change. I'll, I'll tell you yeah. that when I worked in the field around Cassandra, the biggest enemy for a large cluster was config drift. It was those four nodes that got that special treatment when somebody was trying to diagnose a problem and never got corrected. And try as we might with people using Puppet, with people doing Ansible, with all the declarative methods, um, nothing quite gave me the confidence that doing this deploy through Kate Sandra on Kubernetes gave me that I didn't have to deal with that. Let me go figure out how to diff a config file on 400 servers and figure out which one is different. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's what's so interesting to me is that you know today obviously the focus is Cassandra. Uh, the fact that we can bring over these technologies that you know we used to have to configure in more you know let's call them archaic ways uh, to yeah. using something that's Kubernetes centric. Um, and so if you're able to manage a Kubernetes environment with the YAML, you should probably just as easily be, uh, easily be able to manage uh, Cade Sandra configuration. And I think that's sorry. Go ahead. Oh, just adding on that if you're looking at Cassandra and going, man, Cassandra's a little difficult to deploy anyway. Do I want to add an abstraction layer to it with something like Kubernetes? It's worth realizing that a bunch of problems actually start to go away. Things like config drift, things like having ops people that are specialized in Cassandra deployments as opposed to being specialized in uh, a standard deployment that you can get through something like Kubernetes as infrastructure. Yeah. And so the way that that these CRDs is these things work is, and we we referenced it a couple of times already. It says operator model, and I think maybe it might be a good good idea to to draw that out because uh, that brings a lot of benefit to the the DevOps whoever has to manage this thing, right? Uh, it brings a lot of advantages to them. Uh, how does it actually work? Because this looks pretty straightforward to configure. It's YAML. I'm not writing any com complicated code or shell scripts or anything like that, um, I'm defining config, you know, A equals B. How does that get converted into actually managing a distributed Cassandra environment? It's better than defining config. You're being declarative about the end state of your deployment. And it's the operator's job to take that order that you sent it. And I'm curious to get Mikhail's perspective on operators too, because I think about them very much in Cassandra. But it's the operator's job to take that order you sent it and fulfill it, make sure it trues the cluster up to what you claimed you needed in that CRD. Yeah, one of, one of the fascinating things about, again, Kate Sandra is that you can install it with like we are we have been talking about, right? You know, Helm install, right? Um, but but there is a fascinating discussion with the tech lead of uh, Kate Sandra, John Sanda, you know, who talked about where we started to see some limits with Helm. You know, Helm is great for install, uh, but if you want to dynamically manage the, you know, like, for example, the config drifts and things like that, maybe you want some self-healing properties that Kubernetes automatically provides. Um, they talk about how operator was a better model for Kate Sandra. Uh, and that's why, you know, we are trying to arrive at kind of a, a hierarchy of operators, right? You know, like starting with CAS operator, which was there for, like you said, you know, the different components. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know, bubble it up with Kate Sandra operator, which does a little bit more, and then maybe eventually get rid of all these different operators and 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 make it more streamlined, right? You know, that's kind of um, what we are striving for. And and again, you know, it would be I'd be happy to send a, a link on that. Um, to uh, it's it's a four part article which talks about just why you know we decided to come up with this new operator called the Kate Sandra operator. Got it. Got it. So let's let's lay those two things apart. So CAS operator, as I understand it, 
Um, when we're running in a single cluster, so this is a single Kubernetes cluster distributed across multiple zones, and we've got worker nodes in each of them. Um, let's let's talk about it. so the CAS operator itself is gonna is gonna help us manage this single cluster environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, specifically, uh, as I understand it, we're following. We talked about this with the naming confusion earlier. You know, Cassandra has an idea of nodes. Kubernetes has a concept of nodes, but it kind of works out pretty well because you usually only run one pod per node. Um, why is that exactly? Wouldn't it wouldn't it make sense to kind of have more pods to be able to ac uh, accept more traffic? Why do we kind of fill up an entire node with a single Cassandra pod? Depends on how the executable uses resources, right? So a lot of times, if you're building a deployment with something like a web server, it makes sense to have a bunch of processes. Uh, it can actually speak to the availability because they can die and come back or whatever. And it just so happens that Cassandra is already optimized to use the memory that you give it and the CPU you give it. So there's no reason to break it down into multiple processes. Um, that is a little bit of a lie because there <laughs> are some things maybe down the line if you look at some of the documentation we've released about our cassandra as a service astra we actually have started to break that monolith down and and come up with more bespoke pods that are more focused on very specific parts of that data interactivity but for the time being uh for cassandra on kubernetes uh, give a Cassandra node, a Kubernetes node, and it will use as much of it as you give it. So <laughs> there's no reason to run two. Got it, got it. And um, you know, I think that that actually plays into some of the scalability of it. How we can really, um, you know, when we're talking about something like EKS, this has implications, right? And Mikhail, maybe this is a good good question to you. Uh, when we're talking about scaling the backend on EKS to be able to support Cassandra. Uh, is it? It's how does that kind of relate the the kind of single pod, single node scaling, uh, at least uh, on the back end where we kind of scale this up? Yeah, it makes it a lot simpler to be honest. <laughs> I mean, uh, in many cases, scalability of EKS is affected by the number of pods, you, and so because the number of pods is effectively limited by the number of worker nodes, we're pretty safe here. Um, a lot of improvements that need to happen with respect to networking like in a specific EC2 instance out, out of the box or by default will support just a limited number of ENIs or network interfaces attached to it uh, with this model. <laughs> this problem goes away. I mean, you only need one effectively uh, to, to communicate. It makes it simpler as well. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think we, we were trying to see how many nodes we can uh, get into a cluster. And, a system such as a cast that may, can support many, many, many nodes as worker nodes is ideal, looks like, uh, for the scalability model that uh, Cassandra is leveraging. So those Perfect. are, so, think, so it makes it easier at the end of the day. Okay, so that's good. I mean, maybe we had an easy, uh, you know, side of the battle here with uh, the scalability of Cassandra was versus EKS, but. Uh, let's let's talk about that a little bit more. So the nodes themselves. So I want to scale this out. Uh, right now, I only have a three node and three Cassandra node cluster. Mm -hmm. But let's say I start scaling these nodes out. Uh, what's the best way for me to actually start doing that? I want to leverage this something is, like ASG. It's a really right? complicated process. Right? <laughs> right. Yes. From the from the, I jumped onto the Kate Sandra side, but I'll give Mikhail the uh, the ASG side because I think that's worth talking about. And then I'll talk about how hard it was on the Kate Sandra side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, so, so we use generally a cluster autoscaler in this particular case. I mentioned a little bit that uh, stateful set rescheduling and scheduling is where the differences between stateful sets and uh, regular deployments. It has to happen in a particular order. It has to pass certain you know lightness probes and checks of uh, an availability before it actually becomes part of the cluster. There were application specific. Uh, checks at that point as well. The cluster autoscaler, in our particular case, um, we had a choice whether we use cluster autoscaler, which is a traditional way to scale it out. It's going to be adding a one node at a time. We can we have options like we can use, could use Carpenter, which is uh, something that mm -hmm. would be sort of for, for the next iteration that would be fantastic to try it out uh, with that particular setup. And uh, at, at the moment when uh, the scheduler is not finding capacity to schedule the next uh, Cassandra node, 
effectively within the cluster. The cluster at a scale kicks in and allocates a node for that. Um, it will happen in one of those availability zones that we discussed. And uh, the more we schedule, the more nodes will be added to the cluster, increasing our capacity, and uh, all of that is going to be spread out across all the availability zones, maintaining our availability standards. Okay, so underneath the covers, Cluster Autoscaler um, is going to be using auto scaling groups. It's a feature of EC2, right? I'm not necessarily. I mean, it, it is. It is effectively. We will be using auto scaling, auto -scaling groups. We, we can use a managed node group effectively with EKS to to achieve that, and that's what we did because uh, there are a lot of benefits. Um, it will maintain the OS level for us. It will maintain the kubelet upgrades and and things of that nature. So there is a. It, it's a lot, a lot closer to a, be a fully managed EKS service than if you mm -hmm. try to use self-managed numbers with out of clusters, uh, with other scaling groups uh, behind it. Got it, got it. Um, okay, so so that's, I think, kind of answers the question for how we're scaling up the nodes. Uh, and as I understand it, it's just some stress testing as we started upping this, uh, the number of nodes and that kind of thing. Um, now, uh, I think, uh, Matt, you're pretty eager to answer oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on your side. Yeah. So what does it take this, to scale on the Cassandra side? This is deeply technical. So what I did was I edited the CRD and said, I want more nodes. And then I went and watched YouTube videos <laughs> while it scaled up. Uh, Cassandra needs about three minutes between nodes to scale up, which was really the time limiter. And we were doing some big jumps of several hundred nodes. And it really was, um, you know, I was doing... Uh, cube cuddle and updating the CRD. Uh, when Mikhail heard me say that, he said, no, that should be GetOps. And I totally agree with him. But it really was just going in and changing a declaration in a resource definition somewhere and saying, I want more nodes. Some of that is Kate Sandra. Some of that is also just how phenomenally nice it was to deploy onto AWS where there were always more nodes. A game that we played in this was, uh, if I were to do this in production, if I started a new app now and I deployed three nodes on this, when would I regret it? Like, when would I go, gosh, I shouldn't have done that on EKS or I shouldn't have done that with Kate Sandra. And we just didn't find that. We needed more resources. More resources were there. Scaling up was relatively easy um, until that 1200 mark, but that's a, that's a pretty high bar. Yeah, that's uh, who who was actually out there deploying Cassandra to 1,200 nodes. I mean, maybe not specifics, but uh, we're we're talking about an in, insane amount of data and availability and, and you're, being distributed here, right? You're in the Apple and Netflix world when you're deploying that large, and you're running multiple Cassandra clusters at that point, and you're you're in a situation where you need multi millions of transactions per second, um, at you know less than 10 milliseconds per transaction. You need lots and lots of concurrent, fast database interactivity. So Sai, maybe um, you know, for those listeners who are shuddering at the thought of kind of editing CRDs and things like mm -hmm. that, right? Um, if if I'm not the Apples and the Netflix and I really you know, just want to play around with Kate Sandra, um, to be able to scale up and scale down is really editing the resource and, and you know, just specifying the number of nodes. Right. Now, one of the things that's traditionally been very tough with Cassandra is to be able to scale down. Uh, I, you, you can do that, you know, just by specifying the nodes and, and you know, um, the automatic redistribution, everything will happen. Um, so the point is, again, you know, um, using Helm, uh, you just do a Helm upgrade and the same resource and you're good, you know, you're good to go. So, um, uh, and and then of course, um, you know, if you, if you want some some you know really complex um, ways you can you can do that as well. Uh, but if I were just a user, I would just you know stick to uh, Helm upgrade. Right. So again, it's, it's coming back to the fact that uh, with some of the advantages uh, that that we pulled into K8 Sandra, certain configuration tasks are just easier for operations engineer. So hmm. At the end of the day, it's it's a, a lower bottom line for companies that you know they 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 need to maintain this environment. These DevOps engineers can be more effective. Um, now, I guess that's one probably pretty clear advantage of why someone would want to use K8 Sandra over self managing uh, Cassandra. 
I'd love to dive into that a little bit more here. You know, we've got about nine minutes left here. Uh, so I do want to kind of start wrapping this up a little bit. Uh, why would someone manage uh, use a managed service like EKS? It sounds like there's additional layers of uh, comp complexity here, right? Because now not only are you managing Cassandra, but you're also managing Kubernetes itself and it's EKS, and we've got the volumes to worry about. And, and you know, it's managed services at the end of the day. But um, let's talk a little bit about that. Why, why use managed, uh, sorry, Cassandra on managed services over something like pure self-managed Cassandra? I think the big reason is that operator model in Kubernetes. The you don't have to shovel coal to get that engine to run, and so while you may not be as close to each of the individual nodes, you find that you're in this world where you just get to be declarative. Craig uh, Ingram is making some questions about auto bootstrap and some node tool cleanup, and that's the operator's job. I'm happy to answer this for you, Craig, but. That's the operator's job. You don't have to know about that in Kate Sandra world. Um, auto bootstrap matters in Cassandra world if you have to figure out what your seed nodes are. And seed nodes are a thing that people trip over all the time in Cassandra because they can't tell if they're special or not. And they have different effects on how the, the data centers pull data to each other if something's a seed node or it isn't. And you don't even have to say the word seed node. Seed is a Kubernetes service in Kate Sandra that's communicated to the rest of the nodes. You never have to touch it. And there are a bunch of little things like that that just go away. Right, right. And and Rags, to your point, there was a question from Craig here about on scale down, does the operator use node tool cleanup? And I think you referenced an answer to this question, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, so, so you know, I mean, again, I uh, from a user perspective, I really, I really don't worry about it. Uh, it it happens behind the scene again, you know, with the magic of operators, right? Um, you know, it's 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 all done automatically for me. Uh, <clears throat> one other point I was trying to make about uh, this, um, you know, Kubernetes world that we live in, right? Um, uh, it's it's looking like more and more enterprises are developing more and more Kubernetes resources, right? Uh, and they want to be able to do it in a Kubernetes way than kind of do it in another way, right? And, and you know, we have a database as a service also, you know, done everything mm -hmm. via Kubernetes and you can use that, right? You know, it's called Astra. But, you know, if you want to manage things by yourself, uh, I feel like, you know, um, doing it on Kubernetes and using the providers is probably a better solution than kind of doing you know, kind of rolling it all yourself, right? Um, and and there are still some enterprises which do that, uh, but I think increasingly they're moving more towards Kate Sandra rather than kind of doing it on their own. I Got honestly it. started out a little bit skeptical that I would get irritated trying to manage it this way. And I know I've made this allusion to Mikhail before. This feels like the invention of operating systems on the old, like, VAX machines where it feels like I don't have to write drivers to talk to the hard drive anymore. And if we all just agree on this sort of lingua franca, this way of talking about SRE or op stuff, then there are just whole categories of problems we can move away from. Yeah. And it, it yeah. feels like those job schedulers and hardware drivers and all that stuff moving away and we can just focus on our compute problems again. Yeah, For sure. I, you, you can add that the, it's a managed service at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. The control plane is a is been you know hidden from you entirely. The managed node groups it does its job. Uh, GitOps is is possible mm -hmm. now. You get continuous deployment for free effectively, and it is GitOps driven. You probably will deploy for production cases a bunch of things such as network policies, uh, some uh, some kind of policies to prevent configuration drift because you don't want anyone to mutate your configurations mm -hmm. in the first place. And all of that can coexist within the same um, ecosystem, so to say. But it's also a common language so that deploying Cassandra felt so different than deploying Varnish or deploying Redis or deploying whatever. And the more it's a common language, the less surprised I am when I have to figure out how to deploy in something else. The more each of the, the more the work has in common, the easier it is to reason about it. And I think that's really powerful. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, you know, we, uh, Mikhail, I think that's a, that's a great point about what you were saying about where, 
a lot of these things are managed for you with, with the, the EKS side. So, uh, you know, the control plane itself, we talked about uh, the VPC a bit, the IP addresses, you know, the ENIs that are getting generated for you and attached to the, the, the broader VPC. It makes that networking aspect a lot easier. And so really you're not doing some of that undifferentiated heavy lift and managing these environments. Uh, now folks, we are uh, almost out of time here. If you have any I, I gotta sneak this in, Sai. I gotta yeah. throw this in because you mentioned oh, yeah. that. Um, my favorite part of this whole scale to 1200, and you mentioned IP addresses, um, do your IP math if you're going to scale to a thousand Cassandra nodes. Um, uh, those ENIs are, are eating up more IP addresses than maybe you should have noticed in the first place. Uh, I had to delete the cluster at 800 nodes and rebuild it. And it took me five minutes to delete an 800 node cluster. It was a Helm command and then it was done. And that should horrify you. <laughs> but that should also give you an idea yeah. the power of deploying this way. Definitely CICD. Let's lock this down. Don't let people do that. Exactly. But I was done. Imagine what that would have been in a traditional data center. That would have been yeah. a month to clear those resources out. And between Kate, Sandra, EKS, and AWS, it was five minutes, and I went on with my weekend. It was amazing. That's 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 pretty remarkable. Now uh, we have our guests here on today from Data Stacks. Here we've got Rags uh, as well as Matt here. Uh, of course, we've got Mikhail as well from AWS. But for our Data uh, Stacks folks here, really quickly, I'd love to kind of understand what's something cool that Data Stacks has been working on lately. I know that we talked about single cluster, but I know there's the idea of multi cluster, multi region as well. We've got a few minutes left here, but want to give you kind of the ability to talk about maybe something that excites you about what you've been working on. That Kate Sandra operator, the one that you send the CRD to, uh, you can give it credentials for other Kubernetes clusters and it'll manage Cassandra across those two. Because in the end, one thing we never touched on is that Cassandra is really good about geo replication. It wants to talk US East and US West, and your Kubernetes clusters don't do that. So how do you go about managing declaratively something that lives in multiple Kubernetes clusters? And that's baked into Kate Sandra. I don't want to go too deep into it, but it's very cool. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and and um, one of the fascinating things about Cassandra, again, is that you know whether you're doing it within a single cluster or whether you're doing it across multiple regions, multiple clouds even, um, you know, the, the gossip protocol and all work exactly the same, right? So as long as you've enabled networking and use Gates and operator, uh, you can truly install it on multi-cloud if you want to, multi-region if you want or, to. And or hybrid as well. if you're in the middle of a, a, a cloud uplift and you want no interruption, you can just span a Cassandra cluster and move your app stack when you're ready. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I, I, I would think... love to see some sort of uh, guide or tutorial on how we could potentially run uh, Kate Sandra on bare metal servers on premises mm -hmm. using EKS anywhere, connect them up to the cloud potentially for cloud bursting capabilities, that kind of thing. Absolutely I, I doable. Think yep. Some really cool use cases there. Well, what about what about uh, auto replicating? to AWS to use some of the AI ML stuff that's so good that's out on AWS and do enhancement and turn your data into information and then let it replicate back. There's so much neat stuff to build when you start thinking about that. It, it sounds like we need to do a round two of this, uh, get you guys back on the show. Uh, again, we're out of time here, but this has been so exciting here to, to have you folks on do this live lightboard session. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to subscribe to Containers from the Couch on YouTube. We're going to do more episodes of Across the Board with our awesome guest stars. Thank you again so much for joining us, guys, and we'll catch you next time.